Good to have you again, Professor Isepwe. We are glad to have you. And um, I'm sure by, by the end of this master's uh, class, we will have every cause to, to be grateful to you for lifting us from where we are to where we are supposed to be. So over to you, Prof. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I think it's important to record that uh, the precursor to this meeting was the little interactions we had last time, also organized by Harrison and the uh, EKG. I understand that we want to talk more about PhD programs, and I am happy to share some ideas, therefore, about the nature of PhDs that I am, I am more accustomed to supervising or supporting. Okay. I will start by saying that uh, my background is in statistics, statistics, and then uh, in terms of my stress areas, I work across user research, statistics, business analytics, um, stochastic modeling in finance, insurance, economic banking and business, and the uh, entrepreneurship and the digital economy. So those are the areas I, I'm interested in doing something. Okay, so today, what we want to do is to look at foundational thinking and structures that can support effective research and the supervision of such research at PhD level. Uh, I would like to say particularly PhD tech level. Okay. So what I want to do now is to, just as a context, a background, share um, my link tree. I hope it's now on the chat. Um, okay. So I want to do that. Um, the benefit of doing that is that, okay, let me share it for now, one minute. Okay, are you all seeing the link tree now? Yes, sir, I can see it. Okay, so the, the link tree, I know some of you are used to it. It's just a, a kind of a, an app in which you can load up all the digital platforms you are using uh, regularly so that is everything is in one place. So I'll quickly run down a quick introduction and then I won't go into all of them because later on you can, you can always go into any one, but just to hit the key ones. So the link tree is organized under the a canopy of what we call SSGS Academy, that is the skills for students, graduates, um, and the startups academy, all right? Uh, then under it, we also do a lot of things on upcoming events. For instance, there is an event just coming up in November, which is the 2023 Global Higher Education Strategic High Performance Leadership Summit. That is a big one, mainly for very senior or people who are, but any other person that is, you know, in academia can always attend. Okay. Of course, then we have our websites. If you tap into any of them, for instance, this one is the Afri Hero website. That one is also where we are looking more at um, how to particularly support African higher education and research. Okay, so that is for Afri Hero. And then we can also go back to the this thing. Then we talk about Afri World Publishing. This is a platform for publishing the kind of work that can actually shift the needle in impact and socioeconomic development. You, you can imagine the kind of work that comes from your PhD research that will actually impact, you know, high level creation of opportunities, jobs, wealth, digital and, uh, you know, non-digital firms in your countries or any other place you are based, okay? You know, companies of the, of the character of Google, for instance, which you don't have in Africa. So we are trying to emancipate a model that can catalyze the creation of such platforms using, uh, you know, digital tools and things like that, and also using an integrated model. So that's the a special kind of publishing. You notice that this publishing is remarkably different from what people do now, 
uh, in most of the articles we write weekly on LinkedIn, one of them came out today. That's when, when you join, you get a lot of these things. We are talking about what differentiates corporate academics and non-corporate academics, that's traditional academics. And just because it's very important, and that is where I'm coming in later on, I'm, I'm going coming back to this later on, but I'll just flash, flash it up quickly. So under the philosophy section of this publishing platform, for instance, you will see what, if you, you, you see the, the vision that we have formulated for corporate academic work. So if you look at it, it's extremely loaded because we are thinking, for instance, that the traditional mode of scholarship is too narrow in its intent to support effective and accelerated development uh, in developing countries like Nigeria, Sub-Sahara Africa, and, the, and those in the Global South. The reason is that we are sold a dummy about what PhD should be, a very narrow, tiny something, and the person is killing himself on it for about four or five years. And when he comes out, three publications from it, the whole thing is dry. He has nothing else to, 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 you know, to offer. You see what I mean? And it is wrong in my view. So we are wrongly incentivized to do the wrong kind of things just because we want to get promoted. But in this new deal, we still keep all the good practices in the normal traditional PhD, but we make sure that the PhD is structured in a way that it can catalyze activities that are act or some of the activities or elements of this vision. This vision looks at developing corporate academics who are spirit-led, project-led, who can transform and democratize global education and change. Transforming means radically innovating, you know, curriculum structures, research, integration of knowledge, applications, and teaching. Those four main core areas, or, uh, areas of the core university business, as we normally call them, right? Democratizing is to make it almost free, to make it almost free. So there's no need talking about you go to Harvard and because they are selling their brand, somebody comes from developing country and the person is told to pay 50,000 US dollars for what? For something we can best and give free to the world. So this is why we need to democratize it so that every person can afford to be properly educated when we get the payback is when we are now creating those products and services, creating innovative products, services, digital firms, wealth, jobs, enhancing the peace, prosperity, joy and happiness of those individuals as well as their countries. Of course, we can make special cases for any country we want, we're interested in, like our own country, like myself from Nigeria, of course, also UK here, who I'm a citizen, Africa, and generally, the developing countries of the global south. And then also publishing these ideas through multimedia across the Cure Helix. The Cure Helix is actually a, a way of talking about four main areas in which a PhD scholar or any scholar whatsoever should be adding value or at least in one or two of those areas. And that is academia, industry sectors, Government and the So I'll leave that for now because I'm coming back to this later on quickly. So I'll go back and just finish the rest so that when you now go into the LinkedIn, you will know what it's about. Now, the next thing we were talking about, we've talked about the publishing. There is another one we call the iCred 7E. That is actually the, the global university we are building. That is called the International Graduate Open University, uh, also called the University for Applied Research and Enterprise Development. That is being launched 2025 to 2026. We are currently building it at almost aggressively, but I'll leave it for now because it's not been uploaded with content. Okay, but let me go back uh, quickly because once we get this, uh, you know, uh, foundations right, we can now go in depth about PhD text. Okay. So the other thing we also do is uh, we have a center in Nigeria, which is about in Dominican University, the Catholic University in Ibado. Uh, 
which is the International Center for Research and Human Development. That is where we are doing a lot of work to domesticate the ideas we are pushing globally so that people can come there as a venue, also digitally, and get properly trained up. You know, and of course, we can cascade the results across Africa and other developing countries. So that is that one. Um, I think the other one we need to talk about is uh, Glotress. This is, uh, please, Glotress is the main platform where we train and support PhD techs. So that is, you can see it talks about advanced research, uh, graduate research support service. That is the main engine where we, we roll out extremely deep training of corporate academics, you know, including PhD techs, MSc techs, anything tech with a degree attached to it. Publications, every so again, that is uh, the one I wanted to focus on mainly, as well as uh, the publishing where we are looking at the product. So this is just to get you to where things are. There is also, for those that are in data analytics, there is a Sigma Z Consulting, which is my our analytics platform, uh, where we do a lot of machine learning, data science, every manner of statistical modeling. Yeah? So that if you want anybody interested in that, you know, you can also take a lot of value uh, in that one, okay? And then of course, finally, maybe we we'll just take one or two more, later on you can explore. I just want to go, there's also the academy and so on and so forth. Then we have the social media. So I won't talk too much about them, but we, we are on Medium. Like today, we released an authority uh, post on Medium as well as LinkedIn and uh, uh, X and Instagram, for instance. Uh, we choose the platforms depending on the content. So we have Medium, we have ResearchGate, of course, that is for the, you know, and then of course, we also have later on the, my my assistant, we upload uh, my Google, uh, Google Scholar as well into this tree. So you can see, uh, LinkedIn, you can see all the other ones, Pinterest, and so so. So that is an, a quick overview of the digital systems that support what we are doing. Let me now go back to the business of the day, which is talking about PhDs. Okay, for that I want to go back to the publishing firm. Now the reason I'm going back to the publishing is that that is where the framework I'm going to talk about today is. Okay, are you all seeing the framework? Okay, are you seeing the framework? Is it clear to everybody? Hello? Hello? Yes, we are seeing the framework. Okay, so it may not be clear, but what I want to do is to just talk. But it's good to be interactive by looking at the a kind of a flow chart of all that we tend to do in research. So mm -hmm. to do... To do the kind of research I'm talking about that can give us a traditional PhD and its application in one thesis, that is the model that is used to do it. And I want to focus on that today. There are a lot of other things uh, you are going to read in the literature when, when we push a lot of stuff to you um, through your emails and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say at the beginning, when you conceive of a research you want to do, I prefer that people First of all, forget about literature at the beginning, right? And think about a problem that is so, so important that also is amenable to the constructs of his discipline. For instance, uh, if you get a mathematical scientist who has trained in you know, uh, mathematical modeling, he may want to solve a problem with differential equations that can actually enable uh, rockets to be sent to the moon or to Mars, for instance, working with physicists and things like that. That may be the problem. Somebody in agribusiness may be solving an interesting problem of how to preserve the fruit crops, you know, that are harvested every year. But if they are not preserved, they they may spoil. You know, they they have very short shelf life, like tomatoes and the you know, if we do not package them so that they can last, then we lose a lot of money and then we are not able to support our citizens. And, the, you know, uh, so that could be the problem. Depending on the field, if it's an economic, somebody may be talking about stock market analysis to understand the best way to structure, you know, the stock market in order to alleviate, uh, you know, 
difficulties in the economy. So I'm just giving examples here and there. What is important is to concentrate on four bullet points. One, overall aim. I don't want to talk about that. We all know how to write aims, but I need to add that if you want to write aim very well, it's just one powerful narrative about the, the main issue you're dealing with. It's only in the objectives, initial objectives, for instance, that you start breaking it down into specific things you want to look at. And then, of course, you, as you're doing that, you are trying to you know, organize the keywords that can support your literature search. Okay. And then, of course, you need to also talk about the expected contributions to knowledge. That is why you are looking at it as an end-to-end -end process. If I know the nature of knowledge I want to create, based on the nature of problem I want to solve, then I can go forward first in what is called the forward loop. If you look at this loop, it's when I'm starting without even looking at what anybody has done. The problem with traditional PhD is that they spend too much time looking at what people have done so that they can take one of the gaps in knowledge that has been suggested by other people and go and work on it, even if that gap in knowledge is not solving any main problem. So I don't like that. I have to, first of all, Exhaust, exhaust my own thinking about the problem that I'm identifying that I want to solve. It's only after that that I now go into literature. And there are two boxes in which you have to do the literature properly. The first one is the previous literature and then the current literature. Once you do them properly and you are breaking them down into those teams that are important, team one, team two, up to maybe team K, and then you now go to the literature that is a bit more current, you know, and depending on how fast knowledge moves in a particular field, for instance, yeah, you may get a field in computer science, things move so fast. In statistics, not so fast. So you might get a paper from, you know, 2008 in statistics, extremely still relevant. So what you call current or, you know, previous depends on your field. You know, you can just go, maybe the last two years can be your current, if your field is moving fast. The last 10 years can even be a current if your field is not moving too fast, but I don't want to dwell too much on that. So, but what is important is that as you're doing this and you are you know, developing the literature, you must make sure that your voice is clear, researcher's voice. You must make sure that we know what you're saying yourself. There's no need saying, oh, you know, Johnson, 2008, said so, so, and so, then, you know, okay, okay, said the other, in 2020, but if you are not critically telling us what you are using that insight to do in your own work, why tell us about it? So it's important for your voice to come out and we train people on how best to surface their voices in research, okay? Um, now, most of the... any question? Okay, let me finish then we can take question at the end. You know? So. Another thing is the cutting edge. So by the time you are at current literature, you must develop a sense in which you know what is currently topical in the field, the cutting edge. So if you now go from the previous literature to current literature to the cutting edge, you, you have actually developed an historical development of the domain knowledge. That is where the main PhD lies. That is what the traditional PhD is about, as well as the PhD tech. You then move on and say, okay, now that I'm on the cutting edge, from all the literature that I have now re reviewed, what are the gaps in knowledge? What needs to happen? What needs to happen? Because the current literature is what is happening now and recently. But what needs to happen, that is where you now think of making your own contribution. Is that all right? When you finish looking at, let's say there are 10 gaps. There are 10 gaps that you think are important to work on. Then you still may not be able to cover all the 10 gaps, you select maybe two or three gaps that are important for you, then you now use those gaps and go back and come down and say, okay, now that I've seen what is of interest, I, can I go back to my initial objectives? Now I now do what is called a backward loop, this, this arrow going uh, back, because I now have to go and revise my research objectives my research questions, my research, uh, uh, you know, write up the progress so far that I've made after literature. So now you're no longer working with the initial 
way you've thought about it, but an enhanced way that incorporates your initial understanding of what you want to do and the best way to technically do it so that you are adding theoretical knowledge as well as practical knowledge. Once that is done, you now go to the, but let me emphasize that the heartbeat of this framework, we call it the research methods framework, is actually the theoretical or conceptual framework. You all, most of you know about it anyway, to be honest. But let me just give you the take on that. The take on that is that let's say that you've done a lot of work on multi teams and you you have end up, ended up using maybe 500 references for your PhD. To make sense to an external examiner, you need to be able to capture the seminar literature and the main paradigms on a page, just like this kind of page that I captured everything. But and then you're summarizing those things, you know, uh, on a page in normal font. So that by the time and you call it a theoretical framework that will embody the models that you are trying to, to build on, uh, usually semantically, it can be called a theoretical framework if you're working in quantitative sciences or conceptual framework if you're working in humanities and social. But to be honest, uh, some people use them inter interchangeably and uh, nothing is lost. So once you understand that, you, you can see that that arrow is coming technically from those two main literature review uh, you know, items in order to inform the foundations of the research. Now, by the time you do that, you remember, you now come to the research objectives, you make sure that when you are developing the methodology M in this box, you must create a method for each objective. So if, for instance, you are selecting three gaps to work on, you now have three main objectives. Of course, they can link to other things, you know. And those three objectives may have up to five research questions because maybe objective, th objective three has two main research questions. The other two objectives may have maybe, uh, you know, um, two, two, the other one, three. So objectives may have multiple research questions, okay? So it doesn't matter. But let's just talk about objectives, research questions, and research progress. You then have to tell how do you plan as a method to achieve objective one, objective two, objective three. And this has to be forensically broken down to the corresponding research questions. When you finish with that, you now go to collect your data and analyze using whatever you want to use. You know, but make sure that when you are doing the analysis, you are linking the insights to those research questions of the objective so that the entirety is an organic development of a body of knowledge. And you're also interpreting what the ideas are as a pointer to how you even write the bigger discussion and findings, which there are six bullets here, which I haven't captured in this, in this version of the framework, is in another one. Then once we finish with that, let me make an effort to say why this is where we talk of the PhD tech, these two boxes, where you are now summarizing or explicating your contributions to knowledge, all right? Because the way my students do it is to break it down into two main areas. One, they have to generally talk about the theory, the contributions to theory, to research and practice, first of all. By theory, we mean, of course, you know, that conceptual framework. When you finish analysis, the new paradigms that your results are suggesting, you take it back to the conceptual framework and write them in, in italics, at italics, linking them to the particular, you know, corpus of theory that they are affiliated with. So that when an examiner looks at it, he will be seen in ordinary font, previous work, cutting edge, and seeing in italics what you have gained from your research in your findings. It's so wonderful that way. I make a promise to you that if a thesis is developed this way, the examiner sometimes takes only one hour to, uh, for the student to, to defend the thesis. Because part of the thing is not doing the research, but how do you tell the story of your research? This model is almost inimitable for that. So once they finish this, the, so the theory of the area is what happens in the conceptual framework. And now 
when you have added your own insights on the conceptual framework, you have what is called the enhanced conceptual framework. That's the final one. That is the one that you are now using in the subsequent stages of the research, because that is contains what has happened before and what you have now added. Now, the research is how researchers have been using, right? the ideas in the theoretical framework that you captured and how they can now best do it because you've added your own insights. The practice is generally how are these ideas going to be used. This is just a general section. However, if you want to get a PhD take out of this, you have to go into this one, what we call the ladder of contributions to knowledge. Seven elements there. One, the theoretical contribution, which is almost linked to the other loop, just breaking the uh, just ramification of what has happened before with a lot of deeper insights. I have examples of thesis I can show you later. Now you have links with the conceptual or theoretical framework for organic development of knowledge. Novelty in the results, model building or ways of developing applications. It can be apps, it can be better models that supersede the ones you have captured in the conceptual framework. The reason of going to model building beyond theory is to be able to solve that initial problem that you are focusing on, okay? Now, you ask yourself, can I argue that the work is now prescient? That is, has the capacity to change the field or not? Because not every work is prescient, but can still be awarded a PhD. Well, it's a bit lamentable to say that almost 80% of traditional PhDs are not prescient because the they, they are focused on incremental knowledge. You know, corporate academics talk about radical knowledge. You don't, you don't change a field by just say, you know, you know, kind of coming from the house of the last researcher and saying, I have none gone to the last house. No. The important thing, what amount of change is are you bringing to the field as a result of the way you did your own findings? That's so if it is patient, we will know. If it's not, we shall equally know. And I'll tell you some measures of how to capture. Precious, but that's maybe later. Okay, so the next thing you talk about, okay, now that I've covered all this, let me also talk about what are the methodological, what, contributions? Because every time I'm on this, because I'm always organizing my literature in terms of, you know, the research, the method, the applications, and all those things, I must have been understanding the methods that previous people have used. But I can also debate within the thesis to what extent my own method is improving the existing method. So that will be the methodological novelty. When, once you can communicate that, the bigger one that people never ever do in traditional PhD, mostly, unless it's in education, is to discuss the pedagogical merits of the work. How can these new ideas be disseminated in the classroom and through any other forms of teaching, application? How can they be communicated to learners? This is the missing link. 90% of PhDs that are traditional are not talking about the link between the research and teaching. So how do ben students benefit <laughs> from what you've done? So there is a, a kind of, a, you know, uh, separated islands, silos between what academics are doing and what students are learning, unless, of course, they're using their research to kind of improve the, but it's not direct. Every paper I write, when I show, you will see me discussing pedagogical merit. This is a new system altogether. And then of course, you can summarize after that. Okay, so that is what I can say about this uh, framework. Of course, there are other perspectives on how to make this thing, based on these two boxes, a full pack PhD tech and how to spin out digital platforms from the research. Some of the platforms I showed you came from research I did with my PhD study. Okay, I want to stop here for now so that uh, we ask some questions on this and discuss before we go to other ideas that can enable you to convert the results to a full stack PhD tech so that you have two bodies of knowledge in the thesis, the theoretical for the uh, traditional PhD and all the applications or the models that can be used to do stuff with the knowledge. The nature of wealth you're creating from it, the nature of opportunities that can come out you know, based on the Ocelot's vision, that vision we started with, which is the vision that this model is supporting.
Any questions so far? Any questions? Or do I continue and then we take questions at the end? Uh, uh, mining just a comment that I'm, I'm here to understand exactly with the uh, subject. So maybe we'll be having some questions in, in the near future. Okay. Okay. So I can summarize this a bit and then continue to what I call the you know additional ideas. So you can see that this is just a map of the overall research journey captured on a page. That's why it's called a canvas, research methods canvas. This is the model that completely underpins everything I do with my life, okay? Because I feel, and that is important to make this remark, I want to give you a little bit of insight on why this is important. I take Nigeria, for example. In Nigeria today, as uh, you know, um, recognized by the Nigerian Universities Commission, NUC, we are about 10,000 full professors, all right? I, th I think 9,500, the last time I checked. Now, if you make a simple assumption that the professor class, of course, when I talk of professor class, we have to add the readers because they're also professors. But I'm just using in case in terms of the full, because people make a big deal about full or associate. There are a lot of associate professors that are far better than full professors. But let me just use that as a simplification. All right. So now, if you now say that the full professors are just 10% of the entire workforce, which is what is going on in Nigeria now, because most departments are top heavy. People get promoted by writing a lot of papers, even if some of the papers are not adding anything to, to society. So they get to prof. They can't even solve big problems, but they are professors anyway, you know, talking to students and drawing very heavy salaries. Now, it means that if you work it out, another 40,000 academics we join them from graduate assistant to what? To, to associate professor and reader uh, and the senior lecturer. Now, you see, 50,000 academics in a country with 210 NUC approved universities. Then we are not even talking about 60 something polytechnics. This country had its independence six decades ago. This country is still not developed. Who is fooling who? So we just choose to be slaves to the colonial model we inherited when we became independent. We are not even adding anything. It's just uh, because they say that I can only be promoted when I am writing papers called Scopus and H index. You go to my Google index, Google Scholar. I have all those indexes. It doesn't mean anything to me. What? I am doing practically with knowledge is more important. So because of this, everybody is writing papers to become a professor. Nobody is solving a problem. And that is extremely dangerous for the country, extremely dangerous. So that is why I wanted to give you this idea of why I even bothered to come and give this talk. Because we need to start evangelizing the need to transmute the overly narrow traditional academic model to the corporate academic model. And that's why I write every single week, I write an article on LinkedIn, a medium, to take different aspects of this research methods canvas and take it to pieces so that people can understand the mechanics of how this new model can be implemented. Also, how I developed a model for writing highly publishable papers from this same framework. I'm going to give you all the videos. I will, I will go to the, uh, you know, the, the the link tree and point you to the website where you download all the videos that talk about these things. It's there. So I'm going to make sure once I get your emails as a collective, I will tell you where in that zoo of digital platforms you get what you need. So now let me talk about one of the important concepts. Do, do you know when I was in this initial, I was saying oh, initial problem. Do you even know how to choose significant problems that can carry a PhD. Do you know how to choose those topics? I'm not talking about incrementally. Okay, I came with a scholarship. My PhD supervisor is working in this area. He's looking for a student to do incremental knowledge on this area. Therefore, I, I can't even think of my topic. It is what my, my supervisor tells me to do. That is not it. 
You cannot be a PhD scholar, a PhD tech scholar, if you are only doing what your professor tells you to do. You can still do what is, is interested in, but you have to negotiate what you want from your PhD, and both of you can reconstruct the topic. That's what I did when I did my own PhD. Okay, so because we are not thinking of original problems and how to choose them, that is where we start from the very get go, falling on our swords. So there is a principle we use to choose significant problems that we can use our knowledge to solve. And that is called the sweet pot principle. I will summarize it and you'll see it in a video later on. It has three elements. One, is this problem sufficiently global? Not necessarily in terms of geography. That is, you know, what is the estimated population of people suffering from this problem? If it goes into thousands, millions, or not, maybe billions, yeah. Because it means that if I can spend my three years or four years to solve it, there will be buy-in. People will benefit from it. That's first criterion. Second criterion. Can I, through all this amount of work I'm doing in literature, determining gaps, can I actually solve this problem either for the first time, which is a bit rare, because most problems have been solved one way or the other, but just for sake of argument, or improve on the existing solutions remarkably so that the solution I put out will now take over, over time, the ones that are currently existing. The third element, do I have the evidence base, you know, the data and the results to show that that solution that I developed supersedes the existing one. How many academics in Nigeria, for instance, or developing countries understand this principle and use it? Not many. I am telling you this fact. This is why most PhDs are scholarly games, publication games, because you don't have the frameworks to use to think. Okay, this is why we don't produce people like Bill Gates, Elon Musk. We don't produce them. <laughs> we work for them, isn't it? Because we have refused to you know, mobilize knowledge the right way. So that is called the sweet pot principle. The other thing that I can say is that I pulled this framework and developed a better way of writing papers, having nine stages. I am also going to give it to you. Try to take an old paper you've written before and try to re rewrite it under the headings I'm going to give you. Nobody will tell you which one is better. That's why we decided to go and, uh, you know, uh, to build the publishing platform because somebody must build that cart. Somebody must build that cart. That's as simple as that. So I think that's where, I don't know how long I've taken, right? I've taken almost 40 something minutes. I would like to end it at this stage so that we can, you know, uh, take some questions because I'm going to give you a lot of materials. I think nothing is lost. Is that all right? Some, any questions, please? Hello? Any, okay. uh, apparently, apparently yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe we understand it better when in, we uh, are given the material to read over this. Uh, no, no, no. no. The, okay. I will want you to take it this way. Okay. In as much as I'll give you material, try to see from this map, I've just given a narrative of a research journey at PhD and PhD tech levels. The whole of the whole of this is the PhD. This is where you do make it tech. This is where you are ramifying those contributions into particular novelties that can solve problems in the classroom, outside the classroom, theory, research, practice. So because you are already a graduate student wanting to do your PhD, you can understand what I, the story I told. Are there areas in the research process at graduate level from MPhil to PhD? that you are struggling with so that we can use it. So you can always ask a question because when I give you those readings, you are now going to see more perspectives. But for now, what have you got from what I've just said? Otherwise, I will start asking you questions. I can ask you the questions myself. One, what is your field, Mona? Mona, what is your field? Hello? 
Mona. Yes, sir. Yeah, what is your field? What is your area, uh, your specialization? Okay, I'm looking at agricultural policies. Okay, can I take it that most of you are into agricultural something? Yes, sir. Okay, because of uh, EKT's interest, that is his baby, isn't it? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, but when I started, I didn't know uh, that the audience is focused on that. I started giving a lot of examples, but let me come in here. How do you play this within that space? I've even given an example. What are the key problems that we are facing in agriculture? I want you to apply the sweet pot principle to them. Take Nigeria, for example. We are 220 million people approximately, right? What food crops do we produce? Tomatoes, okra, corn, barley, wheat, yam, all those things, isn't it? There are problems of, we may have a situation where there could be drought, you know, drought in the northern area, which can affect productivity or yields. We can also have problems of yields in any other part of Nigeria, for instance. Because these problems are affecting so many farmers, so the farmers are underproducing, then it looks like a big problem. That's what I'm talking about. That's the first criterion for what? the first criterion for the sweet pot principle, that the problem affects a lot of people. You can look at it from the perspective of preservation of, uh, of uh, fruit crops, mangoes that fall every year in Nigeria. Some of them are not processed, some of them will be decay, some of them will just be spoiled because nobody is processing it into juice or something. That could be the problem. And there are so many mango trees and fruit crops across Nigeria that people may not be harvesting in order to package them and preserve them. So Nigerians will just eat as much as they can eat and the rest is spoiled. Is it not a problem for us? It is. You may want to go and look at nutritional content. If you want to combine the agricultural problems with the biochemistry of nutrition, there's a lot of nutrition problems in Nigeria. So you have significant problems. So that is what you're doing at the beginning. You're not look, looking at literature. You are saying, is there an important problem that I can use my skills as an agri expert to solve? Is it in animal husbandry? Is it in plant? You know, there must be a problem. That, it could be even a problem in your own locality, a particular crop like yam. It can be anything. But make sure that the problem is not only affecting you and your family and every other body is okay because if you solve that problem nobody wants is interested that's why you want to make sure that the problem is affecting many people isn't it so that by the time you develop all those solutions for your phd the whole country is benefiting people are benefiting that is what i call please solve significant problems forget about this incrementalism it is a waste of scholarship it's as simple as that i don't know how to be less arrogant about this because okay you understand okay so I just wanted to talk about that. So now that is how I start this box. Thinking, brainstorming. Sometimes I discuss with colleagues the nature of problems that many people are suffering from that my, you know, the knowledge of my field can help me to solve. That is how I talk about it. Now, as it is where you go to literature that you are now saying, how has that problem been solved before? Now, how can I solve it better? That is when the literature helps you. Then you come to cutting edge. What is the most current state of knowledge in this space? How can I improve it? Contribution to knowledge. Are you getting my point now? I'm using this example now to instantiate this thinking. But if you just didn't think of a significant problem, you just go into literature, let me see what other people have done so that I can close their gaps. What if you close their gaps, but it's not solving any problem? What if you do that? Because most of them are not determining the gaps that are important. They're not using the sweet pot principle. So they may be telling you gaps or just they want to just write gaps. How true are those gaps? How important are they? You must come back to significance. Question of to what extent is this problem a problem? So that is what I talk about. So the other thing I can home on, you need to focus more as well on these two boxes that cover contributions to knowledge, very important, because 
you must tell us. Okay, I'll give you an example. When you go to traditional PhDs, they'll talk more about these three things, theory, research, and practice, just in a general way, and make recommendations and run away and collect their PhD and put in the pocket. The problem is, what does that PhD do for us? What does it do even for the field itself? How much theory has been developed? What nature of research can it support? What amount of practice can it support? Sometimes not much. That is why, that is why you must ensure that there is an important problem you solve by thinking at the beginning, not by rushing to literature. Because when you go to literature without thinking about a problem in the way I'm talking about, you are solving somebody else's problem, not your own. I think I've spoken a lot now. I think at the level we operate, I hope that people can ask a few questions. If you really understood the way I narrated this journey, is that all right? Okay. But if you feel you can ask more questions when I get your, you know, your emails and send you a few things, that's fine. It's all right. Important thing is that we can make progress. Okay. Yes. So do you want me to to ask questions that you can copy down and go and do something and so that you, you can bounce it on me and then we can reflect on it. Is that okay? Sorry, Doc. That's, sorry, sorry, Prof. You you yes. can actually send the, the materials to, uh, just like you responded to that email. Those okay. are email. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because okay. everybody okay. will get it when you do so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So if, I want you to take some questions down from me. All right? Before I send you material, I want you to, you know, just copy down. Okay. We are still recording. So I think we are still recording, isn't it? So um, first question. What is my understanding of the nature of a PhD tech? Is somebody asking a question? Okay. Somebody asking a question. Is that uh, Ikechi? Hello? Is somebody no, asking no, a question? No, no. Somebody is raising his hand. No. No, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the, the first question I want to pose is this. Given this journey of the research methods canvas, what is my understanding within my own field in any, any part of the agricultural uh, field, maybe agri-economics and uh, ag agripreneurship, any of those areas of agriculture, food crop yields, you know, preservation of food or anything, and even animal husbandry and things like that. All right. What is my understanding of the difference between a traditional PhD that I can do with a PhD tech, which extends the traditional PhD into significant practice? That's question number one. Two. How can I determine that the problem for which I'm doing this PhD tech research is pervasive enough? It's affecting a lot of people. For example, is it a fertilizer problem that almost most farmers are suffering from? Okay. Because if I can determine that the problem is pervasive, then number one element of the sweet pot principle has been satisfied. Two. How do I develop the methodology, the methodology in this framework, you know, in, in the different boxes, in a way that I can actually solve that problem better than is being currently done? Three, how can I justify that the method I've developed is superior to existing method? That is what you need to go to do in this box. Second question. On the two other bosses in literature, how do I choose the best teams to break my work down into so that I have team one, team two, team three, so that all the teams, up to maybe any number of teams, can bracket that problem that I have thought about? That's the second question. Now, how do I make a critical, you know, understanding, you know, produce an understanding of the nature of literature that are kind of previous and current. And what are the similar paradigms across the entire historical development of the literature 
so that I can actually understand the journey from the previous literature to the continent? That's number two or three question. Four, how do I interrogate, right? the panoply of gaps that I've seen in other people's work, in addition to my understanding of the problem as I started it, such that I can home in on the best set of gaps to bring in to refine my objectives. So I'm combining the sweet pot principle with almost like a, a critical analysis of the gaps that I've collected from other research to select the ones that are meaningful, because not all gaps are meaningful. Now, how do I actually develop a system of methodologies that are actually synergistic to cover important aspects of my research objectives, my research questions, my research uh, paradigms, uh, and then also what nature of instruments can I use in methodizing? Am I actually going to use a mixed methodology involving some quantitative uh, analysis together with qualitative analysis? Given the nature of phenomena I'm dealing with, is it better to make it a more, you know, a purely qualitative research or qualitatively dominant? Or given the nature of my field and the problem, do I, how do I bring in quantitative methods? Then how do I choose the correct methods for the different objectives? And finally, finally, how do I talk about the philosophy? You know, bring it together after developing the methods for each, the combination of methods becomes methodology. How do I discuss the philosophy of what I'm doing, all the isms in research? You know what I mean? Postmodernism, critical realism, interpretivism, anyone, anyone. But if it's a purely scientific, scientific work, then it becomes theoretical models, mathematical models, economic models, whatever. What nature of theories and philosophy supports the work that covers this area? Now, let me ask you final questions. What is the best way to, to present my findings and discussion? I have six steps for that which I'm going to share with you. But let me ask it as a question so we don't forget it. Now, how best can I summarize this first box under theory, under research, under practice? But when I'm doing it, it has to be for all objectives. For instance, what addition to theory is coming from objective one? What addition to theory is coming from objective two, objective three? And I do it right through for a certain a practice for all my objectives. Are you getting my point? After doing that, how do I ramify it into the seven contributions to knowledge in the ladder? That is what gives me the PhD tech on top of the PhD. I think I finished the job, okay? And I want to thank you for your presence today, all right? Thank you very much. Um, good, to, good to attend today's uh, meeting. We will continue again next time.